Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Keely Ogden. I'm a writer and I am the vampire girl. Today we are going to be talking about the big one, the granddaddy of vampire film. That's right guys, today it's Nosferatu, a symphony of horror, released in 1922, first in Germany and then distributed throughout the world. We'll get a little uh, into how that kind of happened um, a little later, but First things first, I just want to say thank you guys so much for all the support on my videos recently. I love all the feedback that you're giving me, and I'm so excited that you guys are still here hanging out with me. This is so much fun for me to do. I love talking about these movies. So without further ado, let's get into Nosferatu. Nosferatu was produced in 1921 by the German studio Prana Films. Now, you've probably never heard of Prana Films, and that's definitely because they only made one movie, and that movie was Nosferatu. Producer Alvin Grau had always wanted to make a vampire movie, and when he found Bram Stoker's Dracula, he fell in love with it and wanted to make an expressionistic retelling of the story. There was just one problem. Dracula was not yet in the public domain in Germany. Grau brought in screenwriter Henrik Galeen to adapt Stoker's novel and make enough changes that they could pass it off safely as their own adaptation. However, it seems like changing a few names and changing a few locations wasn't enough to avoid a copyright lawsuit. The Bram Stoker estate, led by his wife Florence Stoker, ended up suing Prana Films for a copyright violation. The Stokers ended up winning the case and the judge ruled that every copy of the film be destroyed. Thankfully, one cut of the movie had already been released to international theaters in America, where Dracula was public domain. Since then, all subsequent copies of that movie has come from that singular cut. I absolutely love this movie. And now I know it's a silent film. I know it's in black and white. I know that it's old. It's almost a hundred years old. It was produced in 21 and released in 22. That's a long time ago. However, I really hope that you'll just stick around and hear me out because this movie is worth the watch. In this video, I will give you a brief spoiler-free summary of the plot, as well as a smattering of my thoughts, and then anyone who wants to watch the movie, you guys are free to leave and come back later. I will be giving a, uh, a little more in-depth look at some of my favorite moments, some of my favorite framing devices, and talking about how it adapts Stoker's novel into the film. Let's talk plot. We follow Thomas Hutter, who is an energetic young solicitor's clerk from Wisburg, Germany. One day he is commissioned by his boss to help a foreign nobleman named Count Orlock purchase a house in their small town. Hutter knows that he's going to make a fat chunk of change from this and is excited to go. He leaves his wife Ellen with some family friends and he travels to Transylvania in order to meet with the Count and help him with the purchase of the house. Sound familiar? probably why they lost the lawsuit. Um, you know, I'm just saying. That's where I'll leave the spoiler-free summary because there's a lot of really key things to the plot that I don't want to spoil for you. Like I said, I love this movie and maybe it's just because I love anything that has a vampire attached to it. That That's very possible. I understand. However, oh, this movie. The orchestration by Hans Erdmann is incredibly useful in telling the story and keeping you engaged in the film. I mean, we live in the age of dialogue and the age of words and the age of bright colors and action, and oftentimes we can take the simpler forms of storytelling for granted. I honestly did not think that this movie would be able to hold my attention. I. I am scattered on the best of days, you guys. I am, I am, I, I have a very short attention span. But this movie, honestly, was really exciting for me to watch. The way that shots were framed, the way, again, the orchestration, the way it plays to your emotions, the interactions between the characters, the, the costumes, the set pieces. Murnau was a big believer in filming on location. And that ideology just, adds more depth and meat to this film. It's 
amazing. I will say there are times when the acting is a little bigger than most of us would be used to. But again, that's just a product of the time period. You need those big expressions and those those wider movements in order to convey emotion where you don't have the dialogue to do so. Again, please go check out this movie. There are versions of it on YouTube. The original version was filmed with color filters, a blue color filter for night and an orange one for the day. But most versions on YouTube are the standard black and white films. They are still worth checking out. Please do it. Don't tell anybody that I told you to, but public domain. Public domain. Now, if you do not want spoilers for Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror, please exit the video and come back after you watched it. But if you just want to hear my more in-depth thoughts and a bit about how this connects to the Dracula book, then go ahead and keep watching. You ready? Are you gone? Are you sure you still want to be here? Okay, it's your funeral. Something that this film does so differently from the book is that it adds in an angle of the Black Death, which I think is incredibly clever because that's what a lot of cultures think the vampire represents. It represents disease and things spreading from one person to another. I mean, vampirism is a disease. It's also an easy way to explain away what is actually happening. We are always looking for natural explanations to supernatural problems. So I think the plague angle is incredibly, incredibly clever. So props to Henrik Galeen for that. That is an awesome addition. It also really fits in with the fact that Dracula can transform into rats. And what were the carriers of the Black Death, per se? Rats, maybe? Possibly rats? What are scary? Rats? Rats? Scary. This movie also does a great job of adapting Stoker's characters to fit the film. Hutter is, of course, our Jonathan Harker. Very similar names, giving them both H names. Again, I wonder why they lost the case. But that's fine. Hutter is our main character, and he is very, he, he very much captures Jonathan's eagerness, but also his devotion to his fiance in the book, wife in the film. Ellen is also a really great character, and Murnau really gives us subtle moments to inform us of her characters. When we first see Ellen in the film, she's playing with kittens, she's leaning out of a window, and playing with these cute little kittens, and it's adorable, and here's a picture. I promised my roommate that I would put this picture in here because the kittens are her favorite part of any Nosferatu film. So there you go, hon. I love you very much. Look at the kittens, they're so cute. This informs us that Ellen is a very soft, very, very gentle, and very caring person. I mean, who doesn't like kittens? Duh. We also see hers and Hutter's relationship in the way they interact with each other. He brings her flowers. They're always hugging, always kissing on each other. It's very sweet. So when events transpire later in the film, then we know that their relationship is really in danger and that each will do anything they need to in order to save the other. Again, very sweet. We love love. The Van Helsing of the film, Dr. Bulwer, is another really great character. He's not in the movie for very long, but we do see enough of him early on that we are able to recognize him, and we do get little hints at what kind of person he is. When we're first introduced to Dr. Bulwer, he's, he tells Hutter uh, something, and I'll put the, I'll put the screenshot uh, here, he says something along the lines of, you can't outrun your destiny, young Hutter, uh, which seems kind of strange because we're three minutes into the movie at this point, and he's already talking about destiny and being cryptic, but Van Helsing in the book is not very forthcoming with information either, so points for being cryptic, I guess. <laughs> Then we see him teaching a class of medical students. He's talking about carnivorous plants. And it's just, it, it really paints a visual picture of who this person is. That's something this film and uh, Murnau is really, really good at, is telling the story with just the images that he creates. It is fantastic. Go watch the movie. Now you're probably saying to yourself, but Kaeli, Where's the Count? You haven't told us anything about Dracula. Well, 
first of all, in this film, again, we had to make some changes. Uh, his name is Count Orlock. He is played by Max Shrek in the movie. He is... Nosferatu has become iconic because of the physical appearance of the Count. You may recognize shots like this or this and probably most definitely this. The Count is pretty scary looking. Now, going in, I did not expect to be disturbed by the Count or his appearance because I'm so used to seeing these images. I'm so used to seeing the iconic pointed ears and the long nails and the two fangs in the center of his face. I'm so used to seeing it, I didn't think it would get to me. And then I watched the movie itself. And let me tell you, these still images are nothing compared to the way that Orlok walks the way that he moves, the way that he leans over Hutter in certain moments, the way that he leans over Ellen, it's really well done. Murnau, uh, in footage of the Count moving, walking, if he's not directly interacting with a character, the footage is sped up in order to give that illusion of he's moving supernaturally fast. And I think that is a really clever way to use the technology that they had in that time period to show this supernatural movement of this very scary character. The first time we see the Count fully is when he is walking towards Hutter down a, a hallway and he moves. Guys, I can't even describe. I wish I knew how to show you the way that he walks because it's unsettling. It is very well done and props to both Max Shrek and Murnau for getting this feeling of creeping unease so well done. Now Dracula in the book is very strange but he's not off-putting. He's very charming, he's just this older man who is very well spoken but has some strangeness to his appearance. Now we do lose a lot of that charm with Count Orlock because his physical appearance is so startling and again the Count speaks very well in the book but there's no dialogue in this film so we only get snippets of Orlock's dialogue. Now that doesn't mean that he doesn't have some fantastic lines of dialogue. Uh, this one is one of my particular favorites. I laughed out loud. <laughs> um, because it's just so casual and he's like yeah no just yeah i'm i'm dead did you get it did you get it guys i'm 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 dead something else really awesome that this movie does is using orlock's shadow to show the more violent attacks of the movie because again 1922 you can't really show violence on screen it's not it's not very, a, your, your movie's not gonna get distributed. So what Murnau does is he uses the Count's shadow to show the attacks. He shows the shadow creeping over Hutter. He shows the shadow creeping up the stairs. He shows the shadow grabbing onto Ellen. It's so good. And it is a really clever way to instill that terror and that, that scale and that power of the Count without being explicitly violent in in a way to tick off the studios and the theaters and not get your movie sent out to the public. Now, if you watched my Dracula analysis, uh, you know that my favorite part, or one of my favorite parts of the book is the ship. I love the ship scene. It's chapter seven of the book. It's one of my favorite parts and it's so how much fun to see how every adaptation handles the ship. In this movie, the ship is referred to as the Vespa instead of the Demeter. Um, it's still a Russian schooner. The crew begins to fall victim to the plague one by one, and it's not till it is just the captain and the first mate left do they discover what is actually happening, which is just like what happens in the book. The first mate goes down to the hold to try and figure out what's really going on, and he sees this which is real scary another iconic another iconic moment like so good he freaks out 
and throws himself off the edge of the ship. And then it's just the captain left. And the captain, upon arriving in Whisperg, is found dead, tied to the wheel. So, it's so good. A couple of characters that I have failed to mention are Harding and his sister Ruth. Now, these are the friends that Hutter left Ellen with. They have been taking care of her while Hutter's away. Uh, Harding has the biggest pipe that I have ever seen anyone have in my life. Harding and Ruth aren't in the movie for very long, but Harding is an owner of a shipping company, um, so he is called out to investigate the ship. I, it's never specified if it's one of his ships or if he was just having, if he just had cargo on it or what. We just know that he is credited as Harding the ship owner or ship owner Harding. So take that as you may. Ruth is even more of a nothing character. She's in a scene and a half maybe, but she's fine. It's, she's, I think she's mostly there to show that, hey, Ellen is not just living alone with another man. There's a woman here, nothing nefarious is going on. So, something else interesting that I really like in this movie is that Ellen seems to have a very strong psychic connection with, I almost called him Jonathan, that's not his name, whoops, you see why we got sued? Ellen seems to have a very strong psychic connection with Hutter, and I think this is to demonstrate how deep their love really goes, because she's able to tell when he's in danger, she begins to sleepwalk, she begins to call out his name in the night, and she knows that there's something more going on in her town than most people think. A lot of people think that all of the sudden deaths that are happening and everybody falling sick and looking anemic and going to and dying with big holes in their throat, they think that's just the plague and the marks are just made by rats giving people the plague. Not a vamp, not a vampire. Ellen ends up finding this uh, book that Hutter had with him in Transylvania. Uh, it's called, uh, let's see if I can remember off the top of my head, um, A Vampire's Specters and the Seven Deadly Sins? Spirits? Vampire's Spirits and the Seven Deadly Sins? I don't know. But it's this book that Hutter picked up while he was in Transylvania. She finds it and she is starts flipping through it and she reads about the Nosferatu or the Death Bird as they refer to him uh, on the pages. I think that is a beautiful name. The Death Bird? Like what? So gorgeous. Anyway, she reads that the only way to stop Nosferatu is for an innocent maiden, pure of heart, to sacrifice herself and distract the Count long enough for the sun to rise, and the sun will then destroy him. Ellen doesn't do anything with this information just yet, and then she sees the Count just hanging out in his house next door. Because yeah, he moved in right next door to Hutter's house. Which is scary. There's a great shot of Hutter uh, racing home and he reaches their he reaches their home and he takes Ellen home and then maybe a minute of screen time later we see Orlock walk past the house as well great well done way to go Murno I love you you're so good the final character that I have sort of neglected to mention up until now is Nock now, Nock is our Renfield of the movie. He is the one who sends Harding to Transylvania. In many adaptations, they associate Renfield, Nock, whatever, as being associated with the solicitor firm that Harker works at. A lot of it is just to simplify the story. We never get, um, we never learn in the book how Renfield comes to serve Dracula. So this is a, a, a good change and it really simplifies the story. It puts all of the all of the eggs into one basket. That's not the proper use of that analogy, but we're gonna stick with it. So Nock has um, gone crazy. I mean, he was always not really liked around the town because he was strange, but he paid his employees really well. And that's not just me saying that, that's the movie, the movie literally says that. Um, so he's a good boss, but he is crazy. And he ends up getting committed to Dr. Seavers Seavers, Seward, do you see why we lost the lawsuit? To Dr. Seavers Asylum, and Dr. Seavers is, you know, watching over him. 
the people begin to think that Nock is the one who is causing this. They've gone past plague and now they're at vampire. They're just at the wrong one because he's not a vampire. He's just weird and serves the vampire. So Nock ends up escaping. There's this really cool chase scene with Nock through the town. And again, great, really disturbing at some moments. There is a, there's a moment where people are throwing rocks at Nock, trying to knock him off a roof that he's hiding on. And he's getting hit in the head with these rocks and he's got this huge grin on his face. It's head, it's so, it's so creepy. It's so creepy. Go watch the movie, go watch the movie. It's so good. Nock is being suspected. He, you know, they're, they're chasing him through the town. Ellen knows at this point what is really going on because she's smart and she reads books. So when she hears that Ruth now has fallen sick, again, Ruth is in a scene and a half and this is the scene that she's in. She falls sick and that's it. Ellen realizes that she is going to have to do something in order to make all of this stop. People in the town are continue dying. Now her friend is sick. She knows how to stop it and no one else does. So that night she sends Hutter away to find Dr. Bulwer because you know, maybe the doctor will be able to save her. I don't know. It's never explicitly said why she sends him to get Dr. Bulwer. She just starts freaking out and she sends him away. Personally, I think this is to protect him from the count. And then she opens the window to allow the count into her house. Now the count comes in very, and this, this shot, this shot, the, put it full screen editing me this shot is probably my favorite in the entire movie because it's just enough that you know what's happening and everything else is black so you have to focus on that and it's so unsettling and it's just so well framed and i just i love it because it's genuinely terrifying like yikes Get your, get your, get your hands off her. No, give her back. And then um, the sun rises and we, we don't hear the cock crowing, but we, we see that dawn is breaking. And another really clever thing that Murnau does here is when the Count is realizing that morning has come, the, he, he pulls away from Ellen the Count stands up from, from the bedside. The room is so wide and so long. Um, you can look at how the mirror is lengthened, how the window is so big, how the room looks so much emptier to make the Count look small because now he is not the one in power. Way to go, Murnau. I love you. This is so good. And then he tries to leave, but is caught in the sunlight coming through the window and he fades from existence. Nock later confirms to us that yes, the master is dead, very sad for him, but very great for us. Hutter and Dr. Bulwer arrive just as the Count dies, and Hutter is able to see Ellen one more time before she also dies, which sucks because no, don't kill her. She's a good, she's so, she, who's gonna play with the kittens now? movie Mr. Gleam Now I I really like the way the movie ends. It's it 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 closes the book very nicely for me. And Dr. Bulwer is kind of useless. He just stands out in the hall while Hutter cries and he's like, "Oh man, that was a that was I don't know what happened, but that's pretty crazy, guys." As I've said 60 times, this movie is seriously good. It is definitely worth the watch. Now, please do not let the fact that this is a silent film or this is an older film turn you off from watching it because if you at least give it a chance, it does take a little bit of adjustment, but it is worth the watch 100%. Again, the acting especially takes some adjusting, especially Hutter's acting. He's, he's just, I think it's his smile for me because it's so wide and strange, but there are so many great 
moments in this movie, so many clever lines of dialogue, so many clever ways to shoot a film, so many great character moments, that even if you're not a fan of the book or if you're not a movie buff like I am, please do still check this movie out. It is definitely worth it. Let's move into scoring. For each Dracula film I review, I will be giving it three ratings. Now, the first is the MPAA rating. Now this is PG, PG-13, R, unrated, whatever, you know, those, those icky ones. And I will give any content warnings um, relevant to the movie if you wanna go watch it. I will also give the film my rating out of five and a score as an adaptation. Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror is unrated. Any content warning? I would say there are some frightening imagery. There's some disturbing moments, but it's nothing that a normal fan of genre movies won't like, so. There's no excessive gore, there's no naughtiness. It's just some unsettling moments, but those make it a horror film, so you're kind of asking for it. I also give this movie four out of five stars. Again, so good, please watch, do good, go watch movie, please go watch. Yes, go watch. Now, as a Dracula adaptation. I have given this movie a score of 64. 64 out of what? We'll just have to see. But right now, for any adaptations, the score to beat is 64. Any reminder to anyone who hasn't seen my adaptation video, I will be scoring these movies based on character, plot, and finale, and then bonus points because I like the things that I like. So every, char every character will be worth five points, Plot moments are worth two points, finale is worth three points, and bonus material is worth one point each. So, altogether, this po this movie scored 64 points. That is the score to beat. If you want a more detailed breakdown of exactly what this movie scored points on, then um, you're willing to leave a comment below. Maybe I will talk about it more in my live stream on Thursday. I know I keep saying that I'm live streaming on Instagram on Thursday, I just haven't yet. I've been a lot of stuff going on. I've had to refilm a couple of things. This week though, or this week, next week, I will be going live on Instagram at, on Thursday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, you know. So if you have, if you want a little more in depth, um, if you want a little more in depth breakdown of how I scored this movie, leave a comment and I will mention it during my live stream on Thursday. Also, if you have any suggestions for movies, if you have a favorite vampire movie or book that you want me to check out, please leave it up in a comment down below. Leave any questions for me or any, you know, rude remarks, criticisms, degrading, you know, just whatever. <laughs> just please leave it in the comments below. I love interacting with you guys in the comments. It's so much fun for me. Also, please, please make sure to leave a like on this video, subscribe to my channel, and ring the little notification bell so you never miss when I upload videos. I upload every Saturday at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, that's 12 p.m. Pacific Time, and I think 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? I can't count, I don't know. Um, but thank you guys so, so much for hanging out with me today. Please do check out Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror. Again, there are copies of it on YouTube. I bought, I bought it on Blu-ray, it has the color filters over it. I'm I, I love this movie. I love this movie. So please, please go check it out and come back next week to see another awesome Dracula movie review. All right. Till then. Bye, guys.